I just finished the Travis Baumgartner um, murder prosecution. That was the case where the G4S armored car guards were ambushed by Mr. Baumgartner, who is also an armored car guard in the same crew. And uh, three were killed. One was horribly wounded from being shot in the head. Mr. Baumgartner received a sentence of life imprisonment with no possibility for parole for 40 years, uh, which was uh, and is the highest sentence ever imposed in Canada since the death penalty was abolished in 1962. So all homicides, all fatalities are serious, but there was something about this case that really shook the community. Um, it was reported worldwide. There are newspapers in Australia, in England, in Singapore that reported about this armored car heist that actually happened. It's not on TV, it's not in the movies. It really happened and it's quite rare. And for it to be an inside job, even more rare. When uh, people found out that the accused was one of the guards himself, that sort of feeling of betrayal and treachery really went through the community. And I thought that it was very important that the community know how serious we were gonna take this. investigation was so well done by the police, the evidence was frankly overwhelming. I mean, apart from the fact that um, four people went into the vestibule to refill the bank machine and only one came out, and then the other armored car guard who was still outside was also killed. I mean, everything pointed towards Baumgartner as being the suspect. But over and above that, they did interviews with him. They went to his house and got DNA evidence off of his clothing. There was really nowhere for him to go except uh, to admit that he had done it and then start arguing legal issues in terms of what that means, what he's actually guilty of, not that he didn't do it. So the evidence in the case was really overwhelming, um, not just from the Edmonton Police Service, but also the RCMP in Langley and uh, the RCMP here in Sherwood Park. They all worked together to compile this case that um, really closed all of the doors in terms of what his options were. I've been asked sort of what the, the sort of crucial moment was in this prosecution and really it was that morning of September the 9th when we were in the packed courtroom when it was full of media. It was full of the victim's family members. It was full of lawyers who wanted to see this new law used for the first time. Everybody's there, everybody's waiting for the guilty plea and you don't know what's going to happen until he says the words guilty. He can change his mind at any moment and so that moment in time when he said guilty, that was really, for me, the moment in the entire prosecution. Because I knew how everything was gonna go from there, basically. We had worked out the submissions. I had the, the law all briefed and ready to give to the judge. But he could change his mind at that moment. The amount of collaboration um, between myself and senior prosecutors throughout the province was unprecedented. We had to decide, because this is the first time this new law that allowed consecutive parole ineligibility, uh, this is the first time that it was ever applied in Canada. And on such a high profile case, we had to get it right. We had to make sure that the facts were clear. Uh, what are we going to accept guilty pleas to? As it turned out, we accepted guilty pleas to second degree murder where we originally charged first degree murder. Myself and a team of prosecutors, again throughout the province, went through the evidence and satisfied ourselves that those were in fact the right pleas to take. Then we had to figure out, well, okay, if we're going to be taking pleas to sec second degree murders and first degree murder and attempted murder, what sentences would be appropriate? what would reflect all of the different factors in the case, but also at the same time, what would be something that we could present to the accused that he would see as reasonable and an incentive to enter a guilty plea. So we needed something that was fair from our perspective, 
that reflected the horrors of the crime, but also something that was reasonable and would reflect a guilty plea. we accepted second degree murder for two of the guards is because first degree murder requires planning and deliberation. So we would have had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that when he walked into that room to fill the ATM machine, he had the plan in place to shoot all three of them and to kill all three of them. The evidence that we had made it really clear, we didn't have any question that he planned to commit a robbery. Whether he was actually going to shoot them or not and kill them, we didn't have that evidence to the extent that we thought we could satisfy a judge beyond a reasonable doubt. And so we were very satisfied to take second degree murders for those two guards. Uh, after he shot them, he had to walk out of the vestibule all the way down back to the armored car where the last guard was. During that period of time when he was walking there, when he was reloading the gun, uh, obviously he knew what he was going to do when he got down there. That was planned, that was deliberate, that was first degree murder. The victim's families took the victim impact statement process very seriously and they were right to. Um, I've never seen so many victim impact statements on one case, but at the same time, there were three people killed and one person horribly wounded in this case. So of course there were so many people affected by what Baumgartner did. Their victim impact statements really brought home to the court the devastation that was caused by uh, the murders and the attempted murder. Um, it was very difficult, it was heart-wrenching to sit in the courtroom and listen to people pouring their hearts out. Um, I've never been in a courtroom that was so packed. There were over 125 people in the courtroom and most of them were crying. Um, that's just not something that we encounter in criminal law in prosecutions. I think that it really demonstrated that the provisions in the criminal code about victim impact statements and about the court having to take into account the effect of the crime on the victim, it's meaningful. It's not just words, it's not just a process that some people go through and the judge hears it and, and gives it lip service. The judge in this case, Associate Chief Justice Rook, in his decision, reflected back on the victim impact statements and you can tell that they had a very profound effect on him in terms of his decisions uh, in regards to the sentence. We were fortunate, when I say we, I mean the community and the court was fortunate to have such senior defense counsel on this case uh, to be able to work with us to come up with a reasonable proposal for the court. Um, he had his client's best interests at heart throughout the negotiations and that was very clear. Um, but at the same time, he knew that his client was facing, for the first time in Canada, the possibility of life without parole. If everything had gone against him, if he'd been convicted of three counts of first degree murder and received life without parole for 75 years, it doesn't really matter if he's only 21 or 22 years old. Effectively, he would not have the chance for parole. And so that was a factor that was definitely out there. On the other hand, uh, from our perspective, a guilty plea is always something that's very significant. So if we could work together to uh, resolve these two aspects of the case, uh, it's in everybody's best interest. And in fact, when we were dealing with the victim's families and telling them, look, this matter is going to conclude. This matter is not going to be in the courts for five years. You're not going to be sitting in court for six months listening to the evidence trotted out just because uh, we can't come to a, an agreement that is uh, acceptable to all of us. Uh, when we told them that it's going to be over with, he'll be entering a guilty plea on Monday and he'll be sentenced on Wednesday and that will be the end of it, there was such relief from the victim's families. You could actually feel that they were able to turn the page and not be healed, but at least start moving on to the next, the next chapter. When you look at what Parliament wanted, when you look at all the discussions in the newspapers and on TV and so forth, what the aim of this legislation was, 
and the aim was to address people exactly like Baumgartner, who goes in and kills more than one person. The victims' families wanted each of the deaths to be reflected in some manner. So it was this unique uh, procedure that had never been done before, but that with the cooperation of the court and the cooperation of defense counsel was able to make sure that Parliament's intent was actually realized. Albertans can look at this case and see it as an example of their prosecutors coming to court and really getting that just outcome that uh, the community is entitled to.